Welcome everyone to the 18th annual MIT Sloan CIO Symposium and the first digital edition. I'm Ella Allen Tate, the executive chair and your host today. This is episode seven, innovations that will transform the user experience. For questions, please use Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And feel free to chat amongst yourselves, but we won't be monitoring, monitoring chat for questions. If you use social media, use has, hashtag MITCIO and join the community conversation post in the 2021 symposium program under the topic Innovation Challenges. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Naomi Eide. She is the senior editor of CIO Dive and the newly launched Cybersecurity Dive. Also, she was a moderator back in the 2020 Digital Learning Series, and she's back, and we are really happy about that. Please join me in welcoming Naomi Eide. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Naomi Eide, as Alan said. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm part of the Industry Dive business journalism family and send daily newsletters out on all things business, IT, and security. Um, for you IT decision makers out there, um, I'm the journalism source for you. Thank you for joining us today as part of the MIT Sloan CIO Symposium to analyze the future of user experience. With me today is Pratish Manakotia, CIO at Sheila Foam Limited and a 2021 MIT Sloan CIO Leadership Award finalist. As CIO of a global organization, Pratish leads everything from retailing manufacturing digitization to internal IT processes. Also with me is Mark Anderson, who leads Equinex's global solutions architecture organization across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Thank you both for joining us here today. I want to start by just talking about who you serve as a customer, because if we're going to be talking about the future of user experience, we should understand who that user is. So Pratish, if you can start, tell us about who your end user is. So our end user, thank you, Niani, first. And our end user is split into two. One is the internal and the external. And external is we call who is the end consumer for us. And internal is everyone which is there, which is our employees, which is our retailers, which is our wholesalers, even logistics partners, e-com partners, suppliers, vendors. So if I see we have around 20,000 internal users and external is the consumer and they are infinite. So you, the buyer, consumer can be many. So these are the users, and these are users split between three geographies. One is the India, because we have business in there, also in the Spain, and in the Australia, all three places. These are the users. Thank and you. Mark, the same question to you, because you're serving the completely different end of the spectrum. Spectrum. Can you talk a little bit about who Equinix is? Thanks, Naomi. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. We've been working with digital leaders for over 20 years. We work with about 10,000 of the world's most recognizable companies to help them reach their customers, their partners, employees, and their locations around the world, as well as to connect them to 1,800 plus of the world's network service providers and 2,900 cloud and IT providers as part of their digital supply chain. One of the things that I've noticed the most, and, and, and we can all relate to this as, as viewers and listeners, is that a user experience, an ideal user experience, is one that is not interrupting anything. It's it's seamless. Uh, people don't think about the technology that underpins it. And, and that's an extreme challenge for IT leaders out in the market because the ask is for you to deliver near perfection, low latency, nice, high-quality images that the, the the demand is, is quite high, especially as, as users have become so accustomed to having technology close at hand. And I really want to get into this uh, and discuss it at length is, is how do you get, how do you serve a customer? How do you deliver a, a seamless experience without interruption? Uh, Pratish, let's start with you. So seamless experience, I will go on some fundamentals. So I have a here quote, uh, one quote here is great buildings are not made from the guidance or the or the bricks. It's just made with the good design. So similarly, if you want to build a good user innovation experience, there are certain fundamental things you have to keep in mind and you have to keep the user first in the mind. That's where the experience and each user is an individual user you have to treat it. 
it's not that you cannot, it's, it is not the stat that you can take in many of the users. And few fundamental things if I see, okay, what do you think you have to deliver a good design or good experience? I think one is the, one area is the, I like it, is the simplicity, is to be, is to be very simple to use it. That's, uh, that's, more, that's more important. Another is the that it should be very personalized in these days. Uh, what has happened is great user experience if it is not personalized because we are in the personalized personalized world. world. So those things are is happening more. And another, it, it, it tends to be intuitive and the, the experience has to be very intelligent. I have a few examples when we go along to that. And of course, in the last, I will say, it should be gamified experience. It should bring some excitement to me that means if I use it, I, I just create the raw experience, not one day, all the time, whenever I use it. So that's a fundamental I see behind the, any of the user experience with the innovation for the user. And, and to that end, it's the technology that you just described, the, the experience that you just described, underneath it needs to be a solid backbone. And, and I'm here in Washington, D.C., the, um, I think we call it the backbone of the internet, is just a few miles away. And if anything happens over there, everything is disrupted. And, and this, this question is really for you, Mark, is how do you continue to deliver that completely seamless experience um, with <laughs> natural disasters and just simple errors that can disrupt the modern flow of the internet? Indeed, the, the customer shouldn't care about the technology that's for sure. Um, but really, the, the developers of the application have to, don't they? How, when, where, who will use the application? The application looks great, but what happens when the external data sources that drive that personalization that Patish was talking about take longer than they should to refresh? Or what happens when the user is using an application on a location that's particularly far away from the hosting infrastructure? Or what happens when there's a surge in demand that's not being baked into all the tiers of the application's reliance on infrastructure? So a seamless experience means not only uh, from a, a UX experience, a, a, a user experience perspective, but it also means that there's got to be a good quality, well laid out, easy to use application that's easy to deploy, easy to keep up to date. And our customers are deploying applications that are based upon microservices. They're deployed in containers which use uh, composable technology. And composable technology is key here because it's the ability to easily orchestrate infrastructure as code by able, being able to add resources on demand, moving resources around, deploying additional resources as and when it's needed by the application. And we think that in order to do that, it's important that the infrastructure can cope with that. We're used to that in the cloud, but are we used to that elsewhere in a digital supply chain? And so we've been working on uh, delivering advanced um, service compute resources, for example, Equinix Metal, which is a direct, um, which is a, a compute resource available um, uh, close to the cloud, next to the cloud, sometimes far away from the cloud. We provide direct access to clouds like AWS and Azure, et cetera. We also provide access to SaaS services. And we do that on an on-demand basis with uh, technologies like Equinix Fabric and Equinix Network Edge. And all of these allow developers to deploy application elements anywhere in different infrastructure deployment methods to account for uh, user proximity data proximity, data regulatory frameworks, the things that make uh, providing a personalized app experience sometimes difficult uh, related to wherever a customer is uh, consuming that service. So we firmly believe that it's increasingly important to organizations to consider the advantages of distributed computing and an edge strategy in the deployment models when we talk about user experience. And, and this would be, if, if you were starting just all Greenfield, just fresh, seems like this would be quite easy. But uh, as Thomas Hart mentioned, there's no such thing as a new normal, just transitional technology. He mentioned this in the comments, but I, I think it's, it's an apt part of this conversation because 
you, most businesses aren't starting from scratch. They have legacy technology. There's something in their technology stack that needs to be modernized that might be holding them back in a way. And, and Pratish, this, con- this question is really for you because how do you modernize your existing technology ecosystem to serve the end user and keep up with their demand, understanding that you don't have time to just stop everything and, and restart. So, so how exactly do you go through that modernization process? So in the modernization process, I strongly believe in this, that wherever the technologies come, you have to upgrade your infrastructures. You have to imp- upgrade time to time your infrastructures. I think what Mark said is very right. The backbone has to support it. So front thing, something is front end, it's not that is enough for us. So backbone has to be there. It has to be localized. It has to be there. And the modernization still, I will say, is go with the design. It's not with the technology. You have to understand what is your need, what the problem you are going to solve it. Users do not need a technology like they don't want a VR technology. They don't want the IoT. They want their problem has to be solved. Whether it is a modernized technology, whether you, it is, you use the old technology, I think you have to solve user problem in a simpler manner. That I believe it. And that you have to serve in the user. Technologies will keep changing. In two years' time, you have seen many things have been changed. Only thing you have to be innovative, you have to be proactive, you have to see what how should I solve the user, and it should be upgraded time to time. I understand the infrastructure takes time to upgrade, but of course, I think that's a planning, design, blueprint has to be there in the mind. It cannot be, it can be constructed and tomorrow, to, then tomorrow I want to change foundation of my house. That's very tough. Similarly, it's the technologies. And I think one of the the places where this is most obvious and most relatable is the user experience in retail. Um, We all buy things. I bought a couch during a pandemic and I found it to be one of the most frustrating experiences and ended up going to the store. I just couldn't visualize what the process was going to look like once it was in my home. I, I couldn't feel the fabrics and I couldn't sit on the cushions. And I think we can all relate in some way. The past year being in uh, socially distant settings and working from home has really changed what the user experience is, what the retail experience is. And to a certain extent, businesses had to respond. And sometimes it was accelerating strategies they had put in place long ago. But in other cases, it was, let's think fresh. Let's refresh this idea. And so I want to talk about that demand. I want to talk about how you rethink the user experience in, in this kind of different light. Pratish, we'll start with you. But then Mark, I also want to hear about how this is applied to your other customer bases. So given the different circumstances, how have you thought, rethought about delivering user experience? So if we see the in the social distancing, what has happened, few of the outlets people are not coming. Our sales are affecting. So to find something, what we can do it, we can bring this store to them, right? So what that we did it actually, we call it at the program is, is sleep well at the great home. So it's a, you are getting the online online experience, what you get it online from the retail store, it is offline. That's a program we called it. And what we did, if the, if the if the customer comes to the showroom, he walks in the showroom. If you create the similar experience in the virtually with technology, and that's what we have done it for them. And then people go to the home and they can use the VR and they can equally see how they are moving to the showrooms, how they are, they can not feel about it, but they can equally feel about the what kind of matrices are there. And it is like a, a visiting in the showroom. I think that's a where we did something it, it, because the home improvement was the biggest area in the pandemic. People thought when they're in the home, they want to improve the homes. So we cannot lose that, which we just could not lose that sales. I think there we learned that there's another way to do it. Create a virtual showroom, take to them, and then just make them feel like they are moving over there. Similarly, you go to the FMCG. You, today, you go to the site and you choose many things. But if I go and, and I, I can pick, choose like I do it in the store, so I bring the similar experience. I think technology has that power to bring those things. And there we did it. And that's how we answered that pandemic. How do we solve that? And Mark, when we spoke last week, you both had a personal example, but this also applies to uh, what you, what your customers are experiencing. And so how have things changed on your end? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. You know, I remember uh, there's a, a kind of a study about how we talk about frictionless in, in a user experience and and they were pointing to self-service tills. 
and uh, you know that was a that was a, a something that's still deployed right now and you're dealing with queuing and you're dealing with having to deal with a cashier and you're dealing with getting in and getting out of the store quickly. But usually, you know, the the uh, the thing I noticed about the academic studies on this was that when there's some kind of problem that's encountered, the level of annoyance and irritation around that technology becomes hugely overblown. And that paradoxical experience with the technology has an adverse effect on customer satisfaction. And it potentially has a, an adverse effect on a marketing strategy of a firm and, a, and, a, and the loyalty of a customer. Now, we've seen that played large in the pandemic because in that situation, um, there were many problems on many e-commerce sites. Uh, there were many situations where uh, stock levels weren't, weren't correct. Uh, there was obviously massive delays in, in being able to ship product due to, uh, just simply due to the, the pandemic shortage uh, that, that was created due to the, the, the impact on, um, on the process of delivering goods. But, but in addition to that, you know, we saw lack of detail on websites, small images. Um, you couldn't go in and have a conversation with a real person to understand your needs, to be able to, to get their particular product understanding uh, viewpoint on your needs to be able to solve your problem to therefore buy the right thing, regardless of the of trying to pre-experience the product itself. And when you kind of look at it like that, you realize that one of the, the biggest issues or one of the biggest opportunities in user experience is this aspect of just personalization, of the ability for the service to know you a bit better and to know your needs a bit better and to be able to offer choices that meet those needs in a way which you can trust. And, you know, in that sense, uh, when I think of my buying experiences um, over the course of the pandemic, I mean, I tried to buy a record player because I thought, well, I've got this time now. I'd like to listen to vinyl. I would like to sit down. You can't buy a record player virtually. You can't even hear it. You wouldn't know which is a good one and which is a bad one. And I found myself... Uh, watching a lot of YouTube videos, but then in that situation, you're wondering, is the influencer paid to say that or is it actually a good piece of advice for you to choose that particular product? So I think when we look at it in the whole and we think about the purchasing experience, the, the retail organizations really need to look at things like higher resolution and more detailed photographs, video showcasing material. Um, they need to think better about how they're going to do sample shipping. And um, they need to have a tighter relationship with social media where uh, the brand and the retailer and the consumer can really come together in a way which is much more on demand and in a way which is very personalized, including perhaps consultancy sessions with that site, with brand advisors or brand ambassadors. They need to look at site availability, real-time stock and shipping information. This idea of implementing AI assistance beyond the level that we're at right now and they need to make it a much more enhanced and personalized customer experience for it really to work. That's that's kind of where I where I see this going from a UI perspective. And and I want to get to a question that came in through Q and A. And and please keep sending your questions. Uh, I will try to get to them. What tools are are you measuring to? Um, uh, what tools are you using to measure customer experience? Because I think there's a certain amount of like. And you think it, you feel it, seems right. If I'm a user, I might have that instinct. But but what are some like actual tangible um, measurement tools for customer experience and, and improving that user experience? Well, in Equinix's perspective, obviously we run portals and we run all kinds of services with our end customers. And so part of that's kind of through um, Net Promoter Score. Net Promoter Score is one of the key index measures that we use. Uh, as part of surveying our customers and asking questions about their their perspective and how we're dealing with them and how the, our services are driving um, the outcome they're looking for. How about you, Pratish? So how do we measure customer experience? What we do it, we have a cameras which doesn't capture the photographs that we do. We take the privacy and we have footfall cameras we have. We use the take the mood of the customer, how is they have entered it, how they have gone back. I think there we get a one of instance, are they happy about it? How are they happy about the conversation? Did they like the product or did they have not liked the product? 
what's the conversation how my sales person over there is handled them i think there will we get a lot of data from there and that's the instant for us look we also believe in the instant if you do a post mortem fine but you lost the sales i think you have to do instant on that so somewhere we get the feedback from this technology help us we don't have to take them feedback generally people don't like to give the feedback you hundred of the customer one two customer three customer wants to give the feedback generally if they bought the product they are happy they are not bothered i think what we do capture their their sentiments from there and just translate to the store and compare we have got around 15000 store across in india so we can compare their sentiments where it's happening good how what is happening now based on that we also give training to their sales person where you have to improve i think the communication and handling is more important if you handle those with the customer and you're smiling i think you win the customer that's a key product is something else how to handle i think this we technology help us lot in that it's just not tell us the footfalls it's also tell us how is the user went from the shop what's his experience that's where we get the sentiments well i do think it's the it's kind of cliche but um often any news is bad news in terms of retail and comments it's like you're not people are sometimes pretty good about praising and certain incentives related to to offering comments but if i have a complaint i'm going to make it well known and well heard especially if i've invested money in it mattresses are not cheap in my case couches are not cheap if it's not exactly what i wanted i'm going to voice those concerns and so it it goes back to exactly what you were talking about mark too is it's i can't I can't hear it, I can't test it. So how do you build applications that kind of get past those hurdles because that that doesn't get around the the fact of lockdowns. It it means maybe a little bit more trial and error on the um customer perspective. If I'm ordering, for example, a uh, a record player, I might return it if I'm not happy, but a little bit more difficult when you're getting into the larger um larger goods in your home. And so how how do you then build for this future for offering a completely different user experience than merely an augmented in person or a virtual experience that has the same bones as what you would have in, in a physical experience so how do you build an application that is more forward looking than that and, and serves the customer in, in a better way it's so uh, you miss for me yeah so so what we do it actually look uh, what is important for us what are you going to buy a product you should enjoy after that right how whether you buy virtually whether whether you buy in retail with on physically i think that's where we have to be right so we get lot of data we collect lot of data after that that what kind of the body shape is there what kind of just some of the interest which is not touching your privacy what kind of the few of the things we collect the data what kind of city it is what kind of houses is it what kind of the bed is this so it depends not only that what you and what kind of mattress journey people sleep and this depends on the geography to geography so once we get all or capture all those data then we come to know what kind of the personalized near to the personalized because that's for the mass you cannot be do that but mass you segregate you, you make them to the clusters and generally if you find one cluster is similar and there we get the product what kind of product should be pitched what kind of product they should take it no doubt you give them them the best of the memory for mattress but they they have not used it they have slept on the harder one they will not like it so somewhere you have to understand the consumer i think that technology can help and then can suggest what kind of mattress they buy one is that you have a long portion you can ask it another you an- analytics that's the data which tells how many what kind of user are here in this area so we have get analytics of that cluster that tells us what kind of things we should tell to sell to the customer what should be pitched there and this after its feedback then we come to know it that whether what the scene is right or wrong and of course our algorithm gets right slowly slowly and improve it because handling 15000 retailers individually is right up so that's a algorithm help us so you buy a right product that's the most important for any organization not for us customer has to be happy that's the help we decision making we do it another area which is a very selective customer what we have also because those are very selective that cannot be done virtually we use a some kind of a weight distribution system with your pressure points and then the, with with that there are some sensors installed into that you can lie down it can measure your pressure points and then it can customize and make a mattress similar to do you do that so only thing you should enjoy your sleep you should you are spending one third of your time in the sleep when sleep is 
very personalized and very important. If your one third of the life is there, what's the importance of that product? I think that where you have you buy shoes, if it's not going to fit, you're not going to like it. Similarly, is the mattress. If one third of the life you have to spend in that. So I think that has to be comfortable and that's backed up a lot of by data and by technology, both of them. And that's give deliver it to the right product to the customer. That's what we do. And and there's a question that came in from QA that Mark tees up perfectly with what you and I talked about regarding um, research on training it in virtual reality. Because given the tangible shortfalls of the virtual UX, how does AR and VR play into that space, especially over generally available pub- public infrastructure? Mark, can you take that one? Yeah, I was taken by a particular case study that PwC published in May 2020. And they were, they were looking at how VR could play a role in the training of their organization. Now, we already know that VR plays a, a very powerful role in, in education and training. Today, we, we know that with hard skills. We know that because pilots are trained that way, for example. But soft skills, could VR, as a completely new experience, provide any value in training leadership and resiliency and managing through change? That was the, the case of kind of the, the the, the purpose of the study, really. And so what they did was they took um, groups of new managers and they created three cohorts. One was for classroom, one was for e-learning, and one was for virtual learning. And the training was about inclusive leadership. So really a soft skill leadership context. And when they drove the learning the classroom program, the e-learning program, and the v-learning program through the three cohorts, they learned something interesting. They learned that it was four times faster to train people using the v-learning path than the classroom path. They were 275% more confident in applying their learned skills after training. They were three and a quarter times more emotionally connected to the content than the persons who were in the classroom learning cohort. And they were four times more focused than their cohorts in the e-learning cohort. Now, that tells me that the use cases have to be matched directly to the type of UI experience um, that drives the best outcome. We see the same thing in manufacturing and design with rapid prototyping and product design, especially at the moment uh, with regards to working remotely. The ability to collaborate and to create uh, quickly and efficiently together virtually is difficult. Um, And again, VR has been used very effectively in that way to distribute that. But the thing is that any evolution of these um, application presentation methods and the backends needed to support them effectively have three commonalities that have to be addressed. For example, endpoints. So be they customers or be they data sources, they're highly distributed often and they're increasingly highly mobile. And two, there are multi-way data relationships are becoming increasingly the norm for these transactions to to, to really work for seamless payment, for their authorization, for identity, for biometric information, Uh, for location data sources, et cetera, to keep that transaction unobtrusive and offer these highly personal recommendations and services that we've talked about. And that's where AI comes in to power those things and to do its job. And then three, more and more, we're talking about very rich media being transported, stored and processes. And and so, yeah, these things will drive and usher in new possibilities for AR and mixed reality interfaces, but there are, and I guess we'll come back to this later, there are certainly challenges with how you deploy these things on public infrastructure today. Yeah, Mark, I actually wanted you to go further into that, is that we have come a very long way in terms of image storage and what can be loaded in in mere seconds on our mobile devices. Um, But there's huge technical hurdles that underpin all of this and and roadblocks that are are making it difficult to just automatically have this technology close at hand. When you previously spoke, you you spoke a little bit about the HoloLens, about how many 
future issues it, it poses. But I think that same that same example can be applied to any future technology is, is we can't necessarily imagine um, other than what's in the science fiction realm, what, what could be coming in terms of user experience, whether that's direct to consumer or direct to businesses, what anybody is going to be demanding. And so how do you then prepare an infrastructure to adapt to any of it, to whatever future that somebody could possibly imagine? Yeah. So it, it's kind of interesting that when the 4G licenses were being rolled out around the world and 3G licenses before it, companies went directly into the 3G licensing arena and, and bought big and spent a lot of money and it nearly bankrupted many telecommunications companies around the world. And subsequent years passed after they had gotten their 3G licenses and people were not using the data. And it was only until... Steve Jobs popularized the idea of the smartphone with the launch of the original iPhone, that these networks started to be used. And similarly with 4G, we've seen the same thing. So there, you're correct, there, there has to be this linkage between underlying infrastructure and things that can use it and things that drive traffic and drive consumption across it. Now at the moment, there are a lot of big players in the marketplace, Microsoft being one of them, Apple, Facebook being another, Samsung, Qualcomm, who all believe that AR or mixed reality is going to be a big thing. In fact, some of them are saying Qualcomm, for example, is on record with this one, saying that they think that this is a potential to replace the smartphone, to replace a virtual reality headset, to replace AR glasses that we used to know, um, that, that mobile mixed reality is going to potentially be one of the world's most ubiquitous and disruptive computing platforms. And so when you kind of think about that, we, we kind of have to look at, again, what we were just talking about with those three elements of, you know, an increasing number of endpoints and data sources, a multi-way data relationship that has to be uh, continually maintained, and very rich media. When you look at these technologies and you kind of align them with the infrastructure capabilities today, you know, there are kind of four, in my mind, four potential roadblocks for those technologies today. Um, First and foremost, it's clearly data, privacy and security. Mixed reality technologies would create and process huge amounts of very detailed, very personal data about who you are, what you do, what you look at, and even what your emotions are at any given moment. And that needs to be protected. And that needs to be part of a really understood um, uh, acquisitional flow and um the kind of mechanisms that are needed there, technologies like blockchain, et cetera, to, to essentially understand that ownership of that data. The second element is cost. Um, technology costs always come down, but at the moment, there's a barrier to entry to invest in those technologies. And it's essential that wearable technologies be relatively cost-effective, to be usable, to be, to be an ownership possibility for people they obviously have to be comfortable and they have to be fashionable because you won't want to wear something that's horrible and is really uncomfortable. And these technologies have to be connected and they have to be intelligent and they have to be immersive. And so that brings us to the technical, significant technical and hardware issues around this. There's the display itself. That technology really doesn't exist yet. There's the power and thermal requirements. There's the motion tracking. There's the connectivity. And then there's just the illumination in it. How do you present a virtual object in a real world which is indistinguishable from the real object as light, lighting shifts? And that means the rendering technology in this device has to be powerful enough, but also has to use concepts like distributed and edge computing to be able to do the offboard rendering needed to be able to make this work. And that doesn't even cover the AI requirements of actually putting the data in the right place at the right time. And that gets us to connectivity. Seamless and ubiquitous connectivity to both the internet, the edge services, the cloud services are required for these mixed reality technologies to reach their full potential. And that means that means 5G, that means edge compute, that means distributed compute, that means really sophisticated, low latency cloud interconnection, like the kind of services we were talking about at the outset that we're trying to deliver at Equinix. So when you bring that all together, you can see it's a wee bit of a far out situation for these companies to really 
to get out there and compete. And they'll be watching that and looking for when these foundational infrastructures are around that are mature enough to start launching products on top of. Yeah, and I mean, just think about Google Glass and and when it first came to market, it was a, a specific user who was using Google Glass. It was a little ahead of its time and it certainly didn't take fashion into consideration, but I do think there's like these little glimpses at what the future will hold. And with each of them, there has been hurdles. And and I don't think we're quite past that. Now we spent a lot of time discussing the consumer, the the direct to consumer type offerings. Um, And certainly Mark have have touched on then what the B2B aspect is. But I want to get further into that difference between customer experience for consumers versus customer experience um, in in user experience for institutions, meaning the the B2C versus B2B. Pratish, you're you're well suited to start this question given your customers are only end users. You're also working with a network of businesses. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between that customer experience and what you're trying to serve when you're serving um, businesses within your network versus those consumers? Pratish, I think you're on mute. Sorry, sorry. So if you if we see that the internal the internal users are the consumer, it's consumer and internal users are separate. The internal user is part of us. If we see retailers, they are part of us, and we we treat them as an internal user. How can we bring them a different experience? Technology is not that that uh, is experience is not that that you have to build some application fancy application three touch ordering system and the ordering happens fantastic. The UI is fantastic. I think the customer experience is far, far away from that. So it's, it's, it it should know what I want. I think that's the way technology comes in and a lot of technology enable those things. The analytics is there, artificial intelligence there. I think those inputs and deliver customer. If I sit in the tech app, I must know it where I'm going daily. It should not ask me if on Saturday, I'm going to play a golf. It should understand, it should take me over there. It should not ask me a question. I don't even want to use the open the app. Similar with this concept, we and we just studied and we see we have got approximately 15,000 retailers and have four, three times in it, they used to order us because for, for a few of the order, it comes because we they don't keep the inventory. Now, every time they're ordering it and three times in a day, you can say 45,000 orders being placed every day by them. So one day we realized that how much time we are wasting up there, that 45,000 people ordering that. And if they take one minute to order it, how many times, how many times we are doing. So what we will, we build an analytic system on that. And, and the system with a history of 10 years and 12 years, again, on the clusterized, localized, personalized, and we gather those information, what needs to be ordered. And it's a frictionless kind of thing system. And the system now orders on its own. They don't know it what to order it. They get the material straight away. The system is being ordered. It's went to the warehouse. Logistics is being touched and it's delivered to them and shipped to the customer timely. I think that's a power of the technology integrating all of them and just without asking, it has it is it is ordering on the trend. And this gradually this improves and this we have seen it's better than if you order manually. Many times you enter the sizes. In India, it's not standard thing. Or everyone has a customer, a custom size, and everyone wants to have a personalize. So those things are happening, and it's area-wise area. So clustered, so artificial intelligence helps to learn us. And there we do it, that we deliver the seamless experience to our business users, and they get the material on their own. That's the way technology is powering us and helping us over there. And gradually it is improving. It's not that it's perfect 100%. But gradually, these are being learned and these are being improved. I think that's the future that I don't ask anything. I deliver everything to you. That's a a wonderful personalized experience. I think if I save your time, I think that's the way the the innovation, the experiences work. That's it. Well, and I I do think there is so many similarities between B2B customers and B2C customers, because at the end, it's, it's exactly what you were talking about. The goal is that you don't notice the technology. The goal is you don't have to ask for something. It's automatically delivered. Some of that requires data. It requires analytics, and it requires 
automation to make it all possible, to just make the user experience seamless. But there's there's also a certain element that when you are an internal um, developer, when you're an internal technologist in an organization, you also need to understand what the end user is experiencing, whether that's another business or whether that's a, um, a, a consumer, an end user. And so how do you then connect in-house development all the way through to the end user and, and help your internal staff really understand what problems they're trying to solve because it's a leadership question, is how do you get everybody to, to be on the same page about delivering that, that user experience? So uh, what, what we do it actually, I, we don't, uh, we first, the understanding of the business processes is important. What, did, what are the internal, your developer, that has to be there. If you don't understand the problem, I think first thing you have to understand what problem I'm going to solve it. That's on because you want my problem to be solved. I think another area which we use it, which which I which I see is significant, we can use the power of data. One is that we don't take a decision on the gut. We take the decision on some facts, facts is proven by some of the data. I think there is helping us to do that. What kind of decisions we take, what kind of system we deliver, and then again, it's not solution has to be personalized. It has to be kept user in the mind, not myself has to be come into this, that ah, look, I want to design a system like this. And I have to see that each system has to be personalized. When I, when I have understanding and foundation, which I spoke about three, four, five, six foundations, that it should be simplified, it should be well, uh, well connected, understandable. And I say only one thing to my, to my team, look, uh, the experience is like a joke. And if you have to explain it, then it's not good. So I think those things, clarity, you have to bring into your mind, what you need to deliver, why you're doing it, what purpose you're going to solve it. Of course, it has to be backed by the data and the data has to tell us what we need to do it. And that's, that's the philosophy we use it behind the understanding the problem. User is first, the consumer is first, the experience is first, what I want to do it. So we want, we start from the top and come to the bottom, then what technology we need it. And then we find that, how can we solve this problem? If I have to do something in something virtually showroom, I want to feel that experience. Somebody has asked me, how can I, how can I feel about my mattress? So I think it's very tough, but we never say it is not possible. We are searching still how we can give them feel. They touch it, they should feel it. It's hard, it's soft, it's this. How do you feel it? I know some things is impossible beyond us, but it's, it's, sorry, it's not impossible, it's difficult. We have to find solution for it continuously. So that curiosity has to, in the team, excitement has to be there to do something innovative, better. I think that's the way, once you, they're connected, where it's being used, they are involved. I think their involvement comes in and they understand the problem. They are, how this is, we work with the internal users. So they should be fully excited what is being to be delivered. Well, and, and somebody from the, um, in the Q&A brought up a really good question. And Mark, I'm going to kick this over to you because um, in the region that you're in, in the EMA, EA, you're going to be dealing with a lot of these privacy concerns. And so what is the boundary between the seamless user experience and intrusion from a company into privacy? Because there's a lot of things we probably could do with data and with user experience and all that, but there's a lot of things we just should not do. And, and some of this is regulatory. So can you talk a little bit about where privacy fits in this conversation? Yeah, fundamentally, there's clearly the moment tech feels like it can you know it can trade in data um and, and in the future if we want as consumers to participate in uh, and have services which are genuinely assistive to the way that we, that we live we have to realize one thing that that data actually belongs to us and we should care about that data and we should own that data and we should be explicitly allowing or not allowing that data to be shared and who it should be shared with and so for me the the boundary layer between privacy and a company's intrusiveness it should only be where uh, that individual allows that boundary to exist um, and the company should respect that boundary otherwise. And the regulatory frameworks around GDPR um, are designed to, to change the ownership conversation back to the consumer 
uh, rather than the company that uh, wants to use the data. It's, it's explicitly being allowed to use the data as opposed to implicitly using it and expecting the customer to object to its use and therefore stop using it. That's the difference in the balance in the way that GDPR is used. So I think for me, um, we just like we we uh, opt into services such as when we share that data uh, with our health apps and with our health care providers in order to receive that service, we should look at that across the whole gambit of how we operate and how we work. Well, and I think too, there's a difference between uh, permissions um, and, and what a user can allow. And I do think there's there's an ecosystem of understanding around that um, in a way that there wasn't five years ago about what on my smartphone, for example, my camera can access and what, how that then fits into the application. And so it also requires scrutiny from the internal perspective um, from an organization to understand what they're collecting and why. And, and Pratish, I, I want to talk to you about what kind of data you're collecting and, and how you decide what is actually needed, because I think that is the difference between the conversation on data five years ago, when it was like, well, have the storage, might as well collect everything, versus where we are now, where regulation is at play. You just have to scrutinize that process a little bit. So Pratish, what data are you collecting and using to inform this user experience? So in the user experience, we don't store any of the data. We just map, we just capture few of the, like if we capture the footfalls, we don't capture the face. We just map, map, capture the algorithm on, on that. And those are such the numbers. So we don't get into the privacy act of the customer and we don't intrusion into those, don't cross those boundaries. That customer should feel about it, that we have gone into their sleeping pattern, how they sleep it. We don't like that. People now bets comes in where you, how you sleep, you can do and you're connected to the internet. Generally, consumer, we have done some research on that. Consumer do not like that. If their bedroom things can go out, how the movement has been taken, what the sleep has been taken. I think there we are very much, uh, we are just uh, just taken us apart from there. We don't get into that. We just can get into the consumer behavior. We capture their feedback, capture their sentiments, capture their things. And that's the where we come out what consumer needed actually, and do, which is not intrusion of their privacy and all that. That we very careful on that because that's a somewhere can hit us back. That's for the consumer. But if you talk about the businesses, the transactions, the lot of data being captured, all transaction, many transactions have happened, million transactions happen per day, and that's for everywhere. A lot of data being captured, and that's a bigger question. What are you going to do with data? Now have we, we have a regulation in the India that you have to keep. A 10 year locks, whatever you change in, if there's a, in any change in the master record, you have to take a 10 year locks. How you're going to, how, what kind of data, how are going to use it? I think that's a, again, it's a purpose. What purpose we want to solve it with the experience? Can I use in the experience? Can I use to solve the business problem? Experience is one of, of objective over there, but there can be some objective. How can we use the data to solve some problem? What kind of the algorithm we use it? What kind of data we can convert it into it? I think there is the key that we need to understand. No doubt data is collecting. I think that Mark has told it's a huge intense in coming. A lot of sensors throw us the data, what to use it. If everybody's user is coming, how long you have to keep it. I think that's the growth works behind it. What kind of data we can use it for the business. It's not for the fancy purpose, let me tell you. I don't. We don't create anything fancy. It should solve some specific business problem. And if it is related to the experience, it should solve that experience only, that's it. Well, and I think your connections to the business are important there because when when we talk about privacy, a lot of the regulations have to do in this realm of uh, consumer privacy, but then there's this other undercurrent and we're in a very tense cybersecurity landscape, supply chain attacks are rampant. And part of that question is how do I protect business data? Because businesses don't wanna be on the receiving end of that regulatory complaint. And so uh, to have you touch on this again, Mark, can you can you talk a little bit then about the business protections in this, it's similar to how Pratish uh, discussed it? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the, our businesses all operate within regulatory frameworks and it's a global business and those regulatory frameworks are slightly different across the globe, but they have to, they have to comply with 
um, what is done in each individual country and uh, jurisdiction. So when we think about um, privacy, uh, we think of privacy the same way as you would think of as it relates to an individual consumer. But I don't believe there's any real difference in that respect. Um, and in fact, it could be potentially even, even more strictly applied in the sense that the contractual bounds between the multiple organisations that you're doing business with, depending on the context, whether it's you to the customer or whether it's you to a supplier or whether it's it's um, uh, you to, um, to another service provider in the context of a business partnership relationship, um, is bound by the contractual terms that you drive. And so... Uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, customer data that, for example, belongs in our CRM services and those types of things, you know, have to be highly protected and made sure that they do not get leaked, nor do the terms or conditions of contracts get leaked uh, in that discussion. When I think of the relationship that we have digitally with our clients, um, you know, a lot of the work that, that happens either happens through the on the basis of you know a physical interaction uh, between um, their account team and the customer or it happens uh, through a portal um, through uh, the interaction of the customer uh, over the keyboard with our systems and with their specific configurations in our systems and um, we we do not attempt to, you know, in the case of our network infrastructure, we we don't want to be um, a, a an operator of data. We we just we just want to be, you know, we're not we're, we 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 want that to be a seamless transaction where the customer owns their own data through our service and and operates their own network through our service, and so. You know, we have to go through every kind of thing that you would think of as it relates to um, security operations um, in our CISO team related to the operational structure and deployment methods on our portals so that these don't leak data, that they can't be spoofed, that you can't, you know, they don't get deployed in a wrong way, which, which you know, for example, doesn't do um, authentication correctly and opens up customer data for one customer to another customer, for example. So, so these types of scenarios are, are very much part of the bread and butter operational structure of the company because we are a B2B company. Um, you know, when I think about what we're doing now in the context of portal development, we're also moving far more towards uh, the composable side of what we discussed. Um, they're allowing our customers to operate their, their infrastructure, the infrastructure they're using from us, uh, in an API drivable way. So essentially we're handing the keys, the operational structure of the services we provide back to our customers to drive on their own behalf, um, integrated in their own services, integrated in their own technology stacks um, so that, uh, well, they get closer to their infrastructure and their management, but also so that we stay out of the way in creating these potential issues that can come from, for example, you know, a physical interaction where there's a misconfiguration because we heard wrong something. You know, it's it's about allowing that control and management to be more keenly given to the other customer or the other customer. Um, in the in the Q and A, we had a couple of questions come in about VR, and I want to touch on this because it really is indicative of what is the future of user experience. We've talked a little bit about science fiction throughout the course of the panel. We've talked about some of the things that you're doing, um, both Partish and Mark, to kind of serve that user experience. But VR, there's a lot of curiosity about augmented around augmented reality and virtual reality. So I just want to touch on this. Where does it fit into a business? Is it something that consumers are going to be just dealing with in the gaming industry? Or is there real viable, tangible applications uh, for businesses to business or business to customers? Uh, Pratish, can we start with you? Yeah. So if we look at the VR, if we, we have to learn from the gaming industry, there are the games available where you don't think that you're apart. You're physically there. So I think what technology does it is bridges the gap that you're not physically and virtually. I think the VR is the answer, somewhere the answer for that. 
it closely linked with you the the emotions and the personalization i will not say that if i meet you in i meet you in a vr it's it's exactly same but yes it matches somewhere similarly in our case also when people feel about the you you go to the showroom you cannot move around but similarly if you, we have built a vr system for our showroom that we are bringing showroom to showroom to the consumer so it's similar seamless standard experience because in showroom there might be different people different way of managing it i think that's some vr is helping a lot and it is bringing close closely to you it's connecting you that the emotional touch is not there i understand but there yes vr with a beautiful vr integration you can bring some of the emotional touch also and with that the vr is helping how do you use it how you see it so you don't feel a distance that you are standing in the showroom or you standing in the vr and looking at it i think that's a where vr is a great great help and i still see it's not that 100% user going to you you mix users somebody is going to use this somebody is going to use it you should have a platter for everyone you cannot cater to the one user but there whatever wherever we have implemented the vr solutions the customer the younger generation have liked that they have to want to choose it feel it see it they want to make it the way what color i can use it we are also in a, in a bed sheet business what should i put it into it how do i feel like it so that's a where people think about it so i think vr has a great potential in the retail industry like in the online site also it helps you choose the right product a right product means what you like it so that's a right product otherwise the algorithm should work that you should buy a right product so that's a where a combination of data analytics and the vr and bring the happiness to the customer that that would we see we have seen in many of the cases and we found it good mark how about you does uh vr fit into equinex in any way yeah so let's make a, a distinction between virtual reality and augmented reality right so virtual reality is really a it's a te- technology base that is quite akin to just the delivery of of high definition of a video and um the ability to manipulate that video in a in a way that looks real and augmented reality is really more of a two way communication it's what you're seeing and it's what you're receiving um augmented reality we 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 you know we look at it from the perspective of how to help people in our data centers be able to um identify equipment easily for example in Iraq right it can highlight the specific location and and steer someone towards it similar to to the gps in a car right in in that situation uh, virtual reality's role though is more is really very very uh, key in visualizing data and and being able to visualize uh, something that you don't have experience of that's why it's so helpful in in training uh because it allows people to to train in in situations and experiences that they they couldn't potentially get involved with these could be difficult circumstances or they could be uh difficult or dangerous situations that they're working with and so when we look at that survey for example from PwC one of the th- reasons why it was so effective was that they could give negative feedback to people and it was said it felt like it was in a safe environment because it was to a virtual character inside of the VR headset as opposed to a real person standing in front of them um and then the other aspect of it is is the emotional connection now we wouldn't think that a virtual technology could provide an emotional t- uh, uh, connection um but actually because it's such an immersive technology it can provide an emotional experience um for example uh my son has a virtual reality headset an oculus and he let me uh, go you can use google maps and i used google earth and i went to the top of mount everest with the virtual reality headset and i looked out over the himalayas from the summit and i could change the time of day from evening to daylight dusk to dawn and i could look at this spectacular situation and it was emotional it was amazing i wasn't there it was just a photograph but i was seeing it in a way which i would never experience it because i can't certainly climb everest and um i was i was experiencing something that would be dangerous but it was all inspiring and it was emotional even though it was virtual and so these technologies they're so useful for that they're even used in pain relief um there's a company called first hand technology that uses it for health and wellness 
as part of the therapy regime for getting people to use less opioids because it provides an emotional experience. Well, and, and Mark, what you highlighted, and, and just to wrap up here, um, is that technology can offer a lot more than we think and that we expect. And it requires a little imagination to rethink how you can deliver that user experience, that customer experience. With that, this concludes our panel. I wanna turn it back over to Alan. Thank you much for joining us here today. Again, my name is Naomi Eide. Um, I'm over on the Industry Dive family. And thanks again to Pratish and Mark for joining us. Alan, back to you. Well, thank you, Naomi, Mark, and Pratesh for that very interesting discussion. And to the audience, let's continue the conversation. Please post your thoughts in the 2021 symposium program under the topic, Innovation Challenges. Join us today at 4 p.m. at the International Partners Booth. Uh, we will have Michael DiBenegno and Jason Marsh of Flow Immersive for this roundtable discussion on immersive data visualization and dynamic storytelling technologies. Join us tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. for Episode 8, The Innovation Conundrum. Should IT or digital own the digital innovation agenda? Find out. We'll have moderator Michael Schrage leading the discussion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And yes, replays will be posted to the 2021 Symposium Program agenda as soon as we can. That's it for today. Bye for now.